Today we're diving into an essential topic for both internal medicine exam and step 2 CK USMLE exam, and this is diabetes management. We'll be covering crucial high key points that are vital for medical management for patients with diabetes. Stay tuned for valuable insights and tips that will help you excel in your exams and improve patient care. Here is a case of a 55 year old male patient with type 2 diabetes. His current hemoglobin A1C level is 8.5% and he is not at risk of hypoglycemia. According to the American Diabetes Association gui guidelines, what is the recommended target hemoglobin A1C level for this patient? Less than 6%, less than 7%, or less than 8%? The correct answer is B, less than 7%. The ADA recommends a hemoglobin A1C target of less than 7% for most non-pregnant adults with type 2 diabetes. This target is associated with reduced microvascular complications, including retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. However, individualized treatment goals should be established considering factors such as age, comorbidities, hypoglycemic risk, and patient preferences. In healthy patients, hemoglobin A1C goal is less than 7%, with a preprandial goal of 80 to 130 and a postprandial glucose of less than 180. Intensive glycemic control compared with standard control significantly reduced the incidence and progression of microvascular complications in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Less than 6% is too stringent and may increase the risk of hypoglycemia without additional benefit in reducing complications. Less than 8% may be appropriate for patients with a history of severe hypoglycemia, limited life expectancy, advanced complications, or those with significant comorbidities. When considering which diabetic medication to add, it is important to assess the patient's specific needs and factors, such as the presence of ASCVD risk factors, heart failure or CKD, patient's desire for weight loss, cost, and risk of hypoglycemia. Each of these factors can influence the choice of medication and help tailor the treatment plan to best suit the individual patient's circumstances. The ADA advises prioritizing nutrient-dense carbohydrate sources high in fiber and minimally processed when consuming carbohydrates. Eating plans should highlight non-starchy vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and dairy products with minimal added sugars. For patients with overweight and obesity and type 2 diabetes, aiming for at least 5% weight loss is recommended, as it has been demonstrated to enhance glycemic control. However, achieving the desired outcomes may require weight loss of 10% or more. Physical activity recommendations comprise engaging in moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity for 150 minutes per week, vigorous intensity aerobic activity for 75 minutes per week, or combination of both. This level of activity has demonstrated efficacy in reducing hemoglobin A1c, lowering weight, enhancing well-being, and improving cardiovascular disease risk factors. Resistance training should be pursued two or more times per week. For older adults with diabetes, incorporating flexibility and balance training two to three times per week, if feasible, is advised. Weight loss medications or metabolic surgery are options if medical nutrition therapy and physical activity fail to yield desired results. Bariatric surgery is indicated for motivated patients with a BMI of 40 or greater or BMI of 35 or greater in at least one serious weight-related comorbid condition, such as obstructive sleep apnea, osteoarthritis of the hip or knee, or type 2 diabetes. Due to the destruction of beta cells and subsequent insulin deficiency, lifelong insulin therapy is important for individuals with type 1 diabetes. Ideally, healthcare providers should prescribe an intensive insulin regimen, which involves administering multiple daily doses of insulin to closely mimic the physiological action of the pancreas. The pharmacologic agents used to lower glucose in type 2 diabetes includes insulin, metformin, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, and DPP-4 inhibitors. 
The following medications are still available for type 2 diabetes but are not routinely recommended. And they are sulfonylureas, alpha-glucosidase inhibitors like acrobose, meglitinides, and amylin mimetics. Metformin is often prioritized as the first-line pharmacologic treatment for diabetes due to its effectiveness in lowering blood pressure levels, avoidance of weight gain, and hypoglycemia, and overall tolerability and cost-effectiveness. It is typically recommended to start metformin therapy at the time of diabetes diagnosis in conjunction with lifestyle intervention counseling. However, for individuals who are highly motivated and have hemoglobin A1C levels to target, a trial period of three to six months focusing on lifestyle modifications before starting metformin may be considered a reasonable approach. Metformin is contraindicated in patients with factors predisposing to lactic acidosis, including EGFR of less than 30. The most common side effects of metformin are gastrointestinal, including a metallic taste in the mouth, mild anorexia, nausea, abdominal discomfort, and soft bowel movements or diarrhea. These symptoms are usually mild, transient, and reversible after dose reduction or discontinuation of the drug. Metformin can reduce intestinal absorption of vitamin B12 or lower serum vitamin B12 concentration, causing vitamin B12 deficiency. For this reason, an annual vitamin B12 level is recommended. When deciding on a second agent after metformin, think of medications that's been shown to have improved clinical outcomes. In patients with ASCVD or has risk factors for ASCVD or CKD, choose a GLP-1 receptor agonist or a SGLT2 inhibitor. In patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, choose an SGLT2 inhibitor. As stated in my heart failure video, SGLT2 inhibitor has been shown to reduce the risk of heart failure progression, hospitalization, and cardiovascular death. A 42-year-old female presents to her primary care physician's office for a routine follow-up visit. She was recently hospitalized for an NSTEMI. She takes a dual antiplatelet therapy of aspirin and clopidogrel, a high-intensity atorvastatin, and metformin. On exam, her blood pressure is 130 over 80, heart rate 76, with a BMI of 27.5. Her A1C is 7.5%, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? Start glipicide, start empagliflozin, start basal insulin, or counsel the patient on lifestyle modifications including diet and exercise. The correct answer is B start empagliflozin. This patient has type 2 diabetes with an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. In this case, she recently had an NSTEMI. For patients with type 2 diabetes who have established ASCVD or established kidney disease, an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist with demonstrated cardiovascular disease benefit is recommended as part of the glucose-lowering regimen. The following SGLT2 inhibitor medications include canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, and empagliflozin. Sodium glucose coast transporter 2 inhibitors are antihyperglycemic agents acting on the SGLT2 proteins expressed in the proximal convoluted tubules. SGLT2 are proteins expressed in the proximal convoluted tubules of the kidneys, as seen on the image that exert their physiologic function by reabsorbing filtered glucose from the tubular lumen. All four SGLT2 inhibitors, as mentioned previously, reduce the reabsorption of filtered glucose, decrease the renal threshold of glucose, and promote urinary glucose excretion. In patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and those are ejection fraction of less than 40%, SGLT2 inhibitors decrease hospitalization related to heart failure and cardiovascular mortality, irrespective of type 2 diabetes. In addition, SGLT2 inhibitors may be the first drug to improve cardiovascular outcomes in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. 
Reported adverse events with SGLT2 inhibitors and are very high yield on your exam includes female genital mycotic infections, urinary tract infection, fornia gangrene, euglycemic DKA, and increased risk in lower limb amputation. A 42-year-old female with type 2 diabetes presents to the ER with nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. She reports that she has been taking empagliflozin, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor, for the past 6 months. Her blood glucose level is 140, and her ABG shows a pH of 7.28, bicarbonate of 18, and an ion gap of 18. Your analysis reveals ketonuria. What is the most likely diagnosis for this patient? Hyperosmolar hypoglycemic state, diabetic ketoacidosis, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. The correct answer is C, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. Euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis is characterized by euglycemia, which is a blood glucose level of less than 250, and a presence of severe metabolic acidosis with an arterial pH of less than 7.3, or a serum bicarbonate of less than 18, as well as ketonemia. Euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis is rare, but potentially life-threatening complication associated with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. The mechanisms of action of SGLT2 inhibitors is to enhance excretion and block reabsorption of filtered glucose from the proximal convoluted tubule. The loss of urinary glucose creates a state of carbohydrate starvation and volume depletion, increasing the glucagon-insulin ratio and resulting in a state of severe dehydration and ketosis. The most likely diagnosis for this patient with type 2 diabetes on an SGLT2 inhibitor presenting with metabolic acidosis and ketonuria despite euglycemia is euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. The following medications are GLP-1 receptor agonists, exenatide, liraglutide, and semaglutide. Remember, metformin remains the preferred first-line therapy for treating type 2 diabetes. However, the addition of GLP-1 analog should be considered in patients with a contraindication or intolerance to metformin or in patients with a hemoglobin A1c of greater than 1.5% over target goal, or in patients who do not reach their target goal A1c in three months, particularly in patients with atherosclerosis, heart failure, or CKD. GLP-1 receptor antagonists are recommended for patients with a history of clinical ASCVD, such as prior myocardial infarction or stroke, and in patients with obesity. Hypoglycemia when used in combination with sulfonylureas is one of the disadvantages of this medication, as well as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It can also exacerbate gastroparesis, increase the risk of gallbladder or biliary disease, and even increase the risk of pancreatitis. And it's also been demonstrated in animal studies that it can be associated with C cell hyperplasia and medullary thyroid tumors. DPP-4 inhibitors include cytogliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin, and alagliptin. The mechanism of action includes glucose-dependent increase in insulin secretion and glucose-dependent suppression of glucagon secretion. Hypoglycemia, when used in combination with sulfonylureas, is one of the disadvantages of this medication. It can also increase the risk of infections, Increased risk of pancreatitis, like the GLP-1 receptor agonist, can also cause dermatologic reactions, and requires dose adjustments for decreasing kidney function, except for one medication, which is linagliptin. When should we consider adding a sulfonylurea or insulin? Well, if the A1C target goal remains above the target level, whether it's less than 7% or less than 8% as your target goal, and the patient's already on maximum optimal dose of metformin, GLP-1 agonist, SGLT2 inhibitors, and DPP-4, then consider adding a sulfonylurea or insulin. 
choose insulin in patients with symptomatic hypoglycemia, patients with ongoing catabolism or weight loss, patients with a hemoglobin A1c of more than 10%, or if the glucose levels are more than 300. Always start with a basal insulin like Lantus, Levomir, or Glargine, either starting at 10 units per day or using the calculation of 0.1 to 0.2 units per kilogram per day. The most common medications for sulfonylurea includes glipicide, glyburide, and glimepiride. Its mechanism of action stimulates insulin secretion. One of its known common side effects is hypoglycemia, especially in drugs with long half-lives or in older patients taking this medicine. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors were a previous common medication for diabetes but are no longer recommended. The medication includes acrobost and its mechanism of action includes inhibition of polysaccharide absorption and the disadvantages includes flatulence and abdominal discomfort. Diazolidine dions includes rosiglitazone and pioglitazone. The mechanism of action includes increases in peripheral uptake of glucose with a few disadvantages including fluid retention, association with heart failure, edema, fractures, possible increased risk of bladder cancer with pioglitazone. Now that we have started the patients on a diabetic regimen, how often should we order hemoglobin A1c? Well, if the hemoglobin A1c is not a goal or if therapy is being adjusted, order A1c every three months. If the patient is at hemoglobin A1c goal, then order hemoglobin A1c every six months. This ends our talk on diabetes management. Thank you and good luck.